You are listening to the Through the Bible Studio Series with Pastor Nate Holdridge. Join us as we continue our study through the Old Testament book of Proverbs. Here's Nate. Well, as we turn to Proverbs chapter 18, we are continuing on in the general Proverbs that deal with the righteous life. And as I've stated many times as we've been going through the book of Proverbs together, the organization of the Proverbs is most helpful to the way in which we would read any form of literature, the way in which we would read a book. It is helpful from time to time to organize Proverbs according to their subject matter, marriage, family, finances, sex, work ethic, etc., But when you're reading in a devotional kind of setting and searching God's word for wisdom, the way that Proverbs is written is so helpful because you are bound to come up against something in that given chapter or chunk or text, which will be edifying to you in that moment in time in your life because the subject matter is so varied. So it's beautiful for reading, but can sometimes be difficult to teach because you could literally cover 20 different subjects in the span of 20 or 30 verses. So today we come to Proverbs chapter 18, where we continue on in looking at these general statements regarding the righteous life. Verse 1 says, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. Now, the person who isolates himself is a person here who is against society. He's not merely introverted or unsocial or awkward, but he actually disengages himself from community because he does not believe in community. He doesn't see the power of gathering together with others. He doesn't see a reason to go into the congregation and allow iron to sharpen iron. He, as the Holman Christian Standard Bible puts it, separates himself, or as the New Living Translation puts it, is unfriendly. Of course, one of the verses in the New Testament that has always combated this principle because it's said so plainly and beautifully, comes from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, where we are told how to stir up one another, that we must consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There are those, of course, who do neglect to meet with other believers. And because they do that, they are unable, A, to be the target of someone else's encouragement or the stirring up of their lives, but B, they will also not be the vessel of that encouragement because they have removed themselves. And so here that concept is found in the Proverbs. The person who who isolates himself seeks his own Desire. He's breaking out against the laws that God has built. And one of the laws that God has constructed is that we do better in community. The original thing that God said of man is that it is not good that man would be alone. Now, in verse 2, he goes on to say, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Now, all through the Proverbs, this is a major mark of folly. Wisdom dictates that we would seek to learn, especially that we would seek to learn the word of God. Psalm 1 tells us that the blessed man does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He does not stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord And on his law, he meditates day and night. But the fool has no pleasure in that. The the fool does not want to meditate upon the law of the Lord, but simply to express his own personal view and opinion. Verse 3, when wickedness comes, contempt comes also. And with dishonor 
comes disgrace. So contempt and disgrace here are the natural response of the community to wickedness and dishonor. There are natural consequences to our sins. So when you engage in wickedness and when you engage in dishonor, what the proverb tells us will flow is that contempt and disgrace will flow in your direction. The words of a man's mouth, verse 4, are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. Now, in the next few verses, the Proverbs deal with our words. And here, a man's words, the words of a man's mouth, are compared to deep waters. So, and then a fountain of wisdom as a bubbling brook. So, a well or a river supply of water is compared to the words of a man's mouth and the wisdom coming from that mouth. And that's a beautiful picture for us to consider because what you're seeing here is that a wise man or a wise woman, and again, this is biblical wisdom that we're talking about, that person is a continual source of refreshment and life-giving words. I mean, that's really what water does. It refreshes in times where we are parched, thirsty, in need of strengthening. But we, of course, also understand that water is not only refreshing to us, but it is actually giving us life. We would not be able to live without drinking water, without being hydrated. And so when you have a person in your life who is wise, what you have is a treasure. Because at various junctures in your life, you will need the water of that well or the river of that wisdom to flow into your life. So what a beautiful picture of a person who knows the word of God and is able to dispense it to the people around them. It is not good, verse 5, to be partial to the wicked or to deprive the righteous of justice. Now here, the word partial literally means to lift up the face of the one who is favored. So what he's saying here is that this person is showing partiality. They are lifting up the face and favoring the one who is wicked, the one who deprives the righteous of justice. But unfortunately, many people do this. Many people look favorably upon wickedness. Jude, even as he wrote his short epistle near the end of the New Testament, confessed that he had wanted to write about our common salvation, but that he couldn't because he had to write to us to contend earnestly for the faith because of this, he says, for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God and turn it into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So there are those who lift up their face and favor a life of evil, even in the face of the gospel itself. A fool's lips, verse 6, walk into a fight, and his mouth invites a beating. A fool's mouth, verse 7, is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to the soul. Now, There are just some Proverbs that as you read them, the humor is so obvious. Here you have a fool's lips, and they are personified, like they got legs, and they are walking into a fight. And his mouth actually invites a beating. A fool's mouth, verse 7, is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to his soul. In other words, there is a price to be paid for, for rash words. You think of all of the lawsuits. All of the controversies, all of the uproar, all of the division that has been caused through rash, quick, unthinking words. Much trouble comes through our words. There's a story in the Old Testament that reminds me of this particular proverb. When King Saul was seated on the throne and the Philistines rose up against the Israelites in battle. And many people went out into the fight that day, and Israel began to experience a semblance of victory. 
Saul was encouraged by that and excited by the excitement of his soldiers. And so he cried out and said, Cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening, and I am avenged on my enemies. And what happened was the armies of Israel lost their strength and lost their vigor in the fight because they felt that they were not allowed to eat any food because of Saul's rash words and vow. Uh, His son Jonathan, on the other hand, hadn't heard those words and went and ate honeycomb and was revived. And so, so often, our words, rashly spoken in a moment of passion or excitement, uh, they actually lead us into a snare or ruin. The words, verse 8, of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. Now, again, listening to gossip is like eating, he's saying, a delicacy. Now, this is simply an affirmation of human nature because humans enjoy listening to gossip. There's just something about it. it whether it's the understanding that someone else has flaws and that makes us feel better, whether it's just the tendency to be drawn and attracted to darkness and to sinful things. But for whatever reason, we are drawn to listen to gossip. But here, the proverb tells us that it affects us internally. He says, it goes down into the inner parts of the body. In other words, you assimilate it into yourself and it stays with you. You will never see the person that you have gossiped about or that you have slandered in the same way. It affects you negatively. Perhaps to think of it in this way, think of the sickness that follows you after eating too much candy or too much of a a treat. You know, that's the idea here of listening to the delicious words of a whisperer. Whoever is slack, verse 9, in his work is a brother to to him who destroys. Here, the lazy man and the destructive man are related. The lazy man who's slack in his work, he's a brother to him who destroys. In other words, they are in the same family. They are in the same class. Now, the reason that they're in the same class is because the destroyer, the one who's violent, who comes in and just obviously takes a human life, uh, they do it obviously and they do it quickly, but the slack worker, the lazy man, is also destroying. It's not obvious, and it's not quick. It is slow and imperceptible, but it destroys just the same. Paul tells us that we have an antidote against this in the Holy Spirit, who in Romans chapter 12, verse 11, tells us, Do not be slothful in zeal, but fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. And so the Lord is able to make us into a zealous, fervent people. The name of the Lord, verse 10, is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. Now, whenever you see the name of the Lord being spoken of in the Bible, uh, a way that you could consider that is the reputation of the Lord. And of course, the reputation of the Lord or the character or nature of the Lord includes his attributes, who he is. So the reputation of the Lord, the attributes of the Lord, the character of the Lord is a strong tower for the righteous person. And the truth of the matter is that the righteous person knows who God is, and so they run to God for protection. You see, the less you know of God and his attributes, the less you'll run to God. But the more you know of God and his attributes, the more you'll run to God because you'll understand he is a strong tower who longs to protect you and your life. And so this is why I believe it's so important to continually be studying the life of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Part of the reason that he came, part of the reason that he was born, uh, of course, with the ultimate mission to save his people from their sins, but part of the reason he came was to reveal to us the Father, 
to show us who God is. And so as you're studying Jesus, you are learning about God. And as you learn about God, you will continue to run to God because you'll see him for the strong tower and the place of safety that he is. A rich man's wealth, verse 11, is his strong city and like a high wall in his imagination. Now, this proverb is not a rebuke of wealth, but a rebuke of trusting wealth like you would trust God. You know, we've just learned that God is the strong tower, that God is the one who is our defender. And so if a person has wealth, what they should not do in their imagination is to imagine that that wealth is their high wall and their ultimate protection. Now, it would be ignorant for us to say that wealth is never advantageous. Uh, It can be greatly advantageous, but it is not to be ultimately trusted. Think of the man who came to Jesus and Jesus told him a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So the idea here is that in Jesus' parable, the man trusted his wealth. He thought that the full barns would lead to security of life. But of course, that is not true. He says, look, tonight your soul is required of you. Do not lay up treasure for yourself and be in poverty toward God. Before destruction, verse 12, a man's heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. Just as when you see a haughty and prideful heart, you know destruction is coming. So When you see a heart of humility, you know that honor is coming, is what this proverb is telling us. And of course, the ultimate example of this is Jesus Christ. Those who were haughty and prideful toward him, destruction was their end. And of course, he is the chief example of humility and that he lowered himself into humanity, into service, into death, into death on the cross. And because of that, God has, Philippians 2, verse 9, highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. In verse 13, it goes on to say, If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. And so here, just a simple exhortation to listen and think and hear before speaking. A man's spirit, verse 14, will endure sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear. Here is a fascinating Old Testament proverb that basically is saying sickness is easier to handle than a broken or crushed spirit. In other words, you can have a healthy body, but even with a healthy body, if you become depressed, that depression is strong enough to take you out. So, This helps us in our modern age to understand that even when someone looks healthy and strong and provided for, the reality is what's happening internally could be very difficult for them to overcome and to face. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, as as Paul spoke to the Lord about his thorn in the flesh, He heard the Lord say to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And he went on to say that so because of that, I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. There are some folks who seemingly have a stronger disposition or a stronger tendency to to the crushed or broken spirit. And some of this comes through just nature. 
Some of this comes through upbringing and some of this comes through the circumstances of life. But it is good for us to understand that even in our weaknesses, the Lord can prove his strength in and through our lives. Uh, We don't need to pat each other on the back and say, it's okay, get over it, just move on. The reality is someone just might have that crushed spirit. But that does not mean that there is not beauty there and that the Lord is not able to work in the midst of that crushed or broken heart and spirit. An intelligent heart, verse 15, acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. So here, the wise person uses all of who they are, their heart and their ear, their outer and their inner organs, to to pursue the truth. Now, this is beautiful because it helps us understand that it is possible to actually come to the truth. One of the marks of the last days, according to Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, is that people will come along who are always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. But we can come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, there is the ability to understand God's word and to learn and to grow. Now, verse 16, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before the great. Now, this is very similar to the bribe of chapter 17, verse 8, which tells us a bribe is like a magic stone in the eyes of the one who gives it. Here, you have a gift, which might be a bribe, that gets this man an opportunity to be in front of others. This is one of those proverbs that isn't necessarily giving a recommendation, just like a bribe is not recommended by the Proverbs, but it's just something that is noted from life. Look, when someone gives a financial gift, they get an audience with the people that they have given to. Now, we might take this then in our gospel era and apply this to the spiritual gifts that the Lord gives to us. You see, in that sense, this verse or this concept is beautifully redeemed. Because as we exercise the spiritual gifts that the Lord has given to us, it opens up opportunities and doors for us, sometimes even before the great. You know, the reality is, when the Lord called me to teach his word, I believe that he gave me a certain kind of gift to be able to teach his word. And if I think about all of the people that I've been able to stand before in my lifetime, the reality is most of them I've been able to stand before because of the gift of teaching that the Lord gave to me. And that gift opens doors. And think about the gifts that the Lord has or wants to give to you. They will be gifts that open up doors of opportunity to be able to minister to people that the Lord loves. Now, verse 17, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. Every parent and teacher and pastor has experienced the truth of this proverb. You know, the first person to go sounds so right, but then you hear the other side of the story. We have little phrases that indicate this idea, you know, there's two sides to every story or there's two sides to the coin. You might remember in Acts chapter 24 when they brought a case against Paul in Caesarea to the governor, Felix, the Jews hired a lawyer named Tertullus. And when he spoke, I mean, the way he talked about Paul, it sounded like Paul was a bane upon society, a plague upon the earth. But of course, once Paul finally defended himself, the other side of the story was seen. The lot, verse 18, puts an end to quarrels and decides between powerful contenders. You know, the reality, the casting of lots, we might not do it in our modern culture to settle disputes, but in minor and major ways, it can. Uh, You might think of within a home, children that you have to decide, you know, here's a thing that only one of them is able to enjoy, maybe one ticket uh, that has been given to the family Uh, So how are we going to do this? Well, you draw lots or you roll the dice or you 
pick a number between one and ten, it, it kind of settles a little bit of that favoritism or uh, that sense that some injustice has taken place. But then if you take this to the other end of society, you'd understand that arbitration and mediation can so often put an end to quarrels and conflicts. A brother, verse 19, offended is more unyielding than a strong city, and quarreling is like the bars of a castle. Look, when we inadvertently or even intentionally offend someone we don't know, Trust has not really been broken because it was never there to begin with. But when a friend or a brother has to deal with our offense, it's the offense plus broken trust. Verse 20, from the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. He is satisfied by the yield of his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. So here we see that positive words benefit the listener, but also the speaker. But death and life are found in the tongue. And so the idea here is that what we say has something to do with what people are going to receive from us. Will they receive death or will they receive life? Will they be satisfied with the yield of our lips? And of course, as believers, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, changing us from the inside out and transforming us, we now live in a new community where we are to let no corrupting talk come out of our mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. What is to leave? What are we to put off? Corrupting talk. What are we to put on? Speech that is good for building up. And why do we want to do that? Because now, as gospel people, we want to give grace to those who hear, Ephesians 4, 29. He who, verse 22, finds a wife, finds a good thing, and obtains favor from the Lord. Now, it's not mentioned or postulated, but clearly a good wife is the thought. Not just any wife, but a good wife. Now, the background concept to this is Genesis 2, 18. It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him, said the Lord God concerning Adam. You see, Adam became more fully himself, more complete. Humanity became more complete when Eve came into his life. So it's a good thing, if the Lord wills, for a man to be married. The poor, verse 23, use entreaties, but the rich answer Roughly. Now, when a person is poor, they often must do that. They must plead for mercy. They must use entreaties. They must speak in soft supplications, as the message says. They just have to. That's their only option. They have to be very kind and deferential and plead and, and use entreaties and sometimes even beg. But he says the rich answers roughly. In other words, wealth can enable a person to be rough in speech and to even cross the line into rudeness and crudeness. And, you know, the Lord, he wishes to change this in us. Now, the best option, of course, is to be a person who allows yourself, even if you have wealth, to be kind and gentle and respectful toward others. Yeah, sure, with the bank account you have, you might be able to be unkind and rough towards others, But that doesn't excuse that kind of behavior. We should treat everyone with deference and respect. Our final proverb in this chapter, verse 24, A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. The idea here is that the many companions were chosen indiscriminately. So the contrast is between many companions and a singular friend. And the result here is that there's ruin. So you either have ruin with all of these friends that are chosen indiscriminately, or you have one friend who sticks closer than a brother, and ruin is not your end. You know, the truth is we likely don't need as many friends as we often think. 
and to simply have a few friends or even to just celebrate the close, close friendship we have in Jesus Christ, it enables us to be able to endure life well. I know that society loves to sell that uh, we need to be part of some big party and to have you know multitudes of close friendships. But the reality is you'll probably really only be close with a small handful of people. And it's better to be a little choosy about who those people are and have success in life than to have the many companions that lead to ruin. Let the Lord give you wisdom as you choose. God bless you. Thank you for listening. For additional resources and teachings, or to contact us, please visit us at nateholdridge.com.